With the forge built up to the proper temperature, the master smith and his two assistants begin the actual work by heating and hammering separately the three types of iron ore needed in creating a blade. The ores are worked over and over. During this process, the carbon content of each is carefully controlled, adding carbon in one case and removing it in the others. This, at a later stage, is an important factor in producing the various parts of the blade. Each type of them flattened and broken into small pieces. These pieces, placed on a spatula in various combinations, will produce metals of different characteristics when again fused into one. This process also removes any remaining impurities. The completed puzzle is then covered with straw ash and a watery clay. This covering, like the lid on a frying pan, helps keep a constant heat throughout the steel as it is being worked. This firing and refiring of the various combinations will be repeated again and again. The master's disciples help him pound and fold the metal, repeating the process several times until the texture is even throughout and the quality of steel desired for each type is obtained. This method of hammering, doubling back, and forge welding, practiced since prehistoric times, draws out all flaws. The toughness of the finished product is controlled by how many times the bar is hammered out and welded back on itself. The smiths have employed the most laborious and best methods known to produce the several different types of steel. Now, one steel will be hammered into the fine cutting edge. The others will form the back, the core, and the handle of the blade. Another will be produced, which will eventually bind the others together into the finished masterpiece, and the whole will be polished to a mirror-like sheet. With the metal again heated to the required temperature, the master smith's mind returns to the work at hand. Now fused, the hole is refined and fired some 13 times. It is then lengthened and refined even more as it is slowly shaped into a rod. This rod the smiths have so painstakingly formed is now cut at 50 centimeters or approximately 20 inches. Then it is cooled, weighed, and inspected for flaws. Now the decision must be made. Is this blade worth continuing or must it be scrapped and the whole process begun again? After careful inspection, the master feels he is at this point on the way to producing a fine blade. So he attaches the steel manufactured for the handle to the main rod and continues the shaping process. Then the tip or point of the blade is formed. The work of firing and hammering is repeated as the rod is slowly stretched to the length of the finished blade. Now the smith will take the rod to a vise where he shaves and files it 
into the first rough form of a blade. When this step has been completed, it will be taken to the grinding stone where all the rough edges will be smoothed away. Then the master smith will retire to another building to prepare the blade for tempering. Here, in a spotlessly clean room, the master will cover the blade with various layers of clay, which he blends according to his own secret formulas. Slowly, meticulously, the clays will be applied in a prescribed manner, which has been used by the master's family for generations. This extreme secretiveness has been the biggest obstacle in the development of the sword maker's art. A master smith would not even tell his eldest son, who would carry on his work, the most intricate parts of his formula until he lay on his deathbed. If he died unexpectedly, his secrets died with him, and his son could only experiment until he too found the right combinations. Of all the secret processes, Probably the most closely guarded is the tempering for which the blade is now being prepared. During the final tempering, the clay-covered blade will be once again subjected to fire and water. At this time, the steel will become extremely hard along the cutting edge where the clay is thinnest. If the blade is sharpened and cared for correctly, this fine edge will remain long beyond the life of its owner. At the same time, the thicker layers of clay will cause the remainder of the blade to retain a certain amount of softness and flexibility. While the master is preparing the blade, his assistants are readying the forge. The fire pit is thoroughly cleaned, but some of the fire originally started from the altar candle is carefully set aside to be used in lighting the new charcoal. The charcoal used in tempering will be cut much smaller than that used for the other processes. It requires three years of training for an apprentice smith to learn just this seemingly simple charcoal cutting process. Quick and nimble hands are needed for this job, and an even quicker eye. One slip could mean the loss of a finger. The moment of truth for this particular blade is moving ever closer. The tension seems to rise in direct proportion to the heat from the new fire. Traditionally, the final tempering is done at midnight. This is actually based on a sound scientific rule which says that one of the best ways to judge when steel is ready for tempering is by its color when seen in complete darkness. As the fateful moment approaches, the only sounds heard are the snap of the fire and the sigh of the bellows. With a silent prayer on his lips, the smith takes the blade from the coals. Then... <laughs> through the smith's mind races a question, what do I have? A piece of art worthy of my name, or only a piece of junk steel for the scrap heap? It looks good. But only after the clay is removed and the blade inspected will he really know for sure. It is an anxious moment for everyone. Master Smith smiles his approval. The blade has passed his critical inspection. Now the work can be completed.
The curve is corrected by lightly tapping the blade on a heated block of grooved copper. Now it is time for the finishing touches. First, the handle will be filed in a definite design. Each smith's own filing pattern, which makes identification of even the oldest blades relatively easy for an expert appraiser. The blade will be given one more polishing by the master smith himself. Any further polishing will be done by still another artist, especially trained for this job. Finally, with great pride, the master smith will chisel on the handle, his name, and the name of the province in which the blade is made. The work is finished. Its first owner wore it proudly and with honor. It was then handed down from generation to generation, even beyond the age of the samurai, which ended shortly after Japan was opened to the Western world by the arrival of Commodore Perry in 1853.